you can almost forget what you're supposed to do next. Good morning. I'm glad to see all of you here this morning. My name is Emily Sloan, one of your elders. I serve on the Worship and Music Committee, the COVID Task Force, and the Transitional Pastor Search Committee. I'd like to give you a few announcements and a few reminders. First, if you would sign the fellowship pads at the end of your pews and make sure all of your people on your pew do that. And if you are in need of pastoral care for the next two weeks, Erica uh, Sundrud, our elder in charge of that for the next two weeks, um, her phone number is 617-838-2496. And you'll see this same information Uh, on the visitor's table out there. If you are a visitor, there is a gift bag out there for you as well. The following information was um, sent out on Thursday uh, in the congregational update this week. However, some of you may have missed it. Um, how, How many of you get the congregational update? Okay, so some of you might not have seen this, and I'm going to read it for you because I think it's it's, um, important for you to know where we stand with our pastoral search. A team has been commissioned to search for a transitional pastor in advance of the efforts to find our next called pastor. The team is composed of four elders, Mary Helen Cohn, Tim O'Neill, Emily Sloan, and Erica Sundrud. Since the departure of Reverend Dan Comerford in May, the team has reviewed over 25 pastoral information forms and conducted three interviews. The team has scheduled another interview for next week. Also, the session has approved funds to allow us to bring a prospective pastor for a church campus tour. We are as anxious as each of you to call a transitional pastor, but the available candidate pool is limited. Please continue to pray for the search team and our church's leadership as we continue to navigate the process and fill this important position. Additional information regarding our preschool. Um, Our director that most of you met last week was here with us, uh, Elizabeth Lowe, has been hard at work. She has called every single parent and she knows that there will be um, uh, enough children for at least six classes. She is also interviewing teachers. By the way, if you know of a teacher, let her know. Thank you. Um, I got this information last Tuesday, so I'm sure there's many more things developing through the week. God has been very good to us as we navigate this situation. We're beginning our new Sunday School curriculum this week. It was developed by our denomination and is for all ages, including adults. I think we'll find it very interesting that all of us will be studying the same information, the same topics, and be able to have family discussions about what we study. The adult class begins at 9 o'clock in the Harrington Parlor. Children will have Sunday School after the children's message. And the youth group will meet tonight from 5 to 7, and they will study their level of the curriculum. As we watch and pray about our brothers and sisters in Haiti, if you want to give to support their recovery, you can support Presbyterian Disaster Assistance by contacting presbyterianmission.org. Finally, today we want to welcome to our pulpit uh, Dr. Bruce Irvin. Dr. Irwin, we are so happy to have you with us today. Thank you so much for being here. And we also have with us today the Tropical Flutes. Thank you so much. Your music adds so much to our worship, and we are very grateful. We have with us the director, Kimberly Aliopoulos, Savannah Clark, Lucas Jones, Laura Putman, and our own Robin Sykes Rowe. Thank you so much for that. We are going to have a postlude by the flutes at the end of the service. If you can possibly stay to hear that, 
That would be wonderful. Thank you. Please stand for the call to worship. O oh, come, let us worship God, the Creator. Persuade palms, blue green ocean waters, for abundant food and our life's breath, we worship the Creator God. In this holy place, let us worship God, our Sustainer. As we gather, let us give thanks for God's Holy Spirit, our constant comforter. Let us now pause our busy lives and our constant focus on ourselves to honestly evaluate our relationship with God. Often we deceive ourselves with our own importance. Sometimes we are led astray by the lies we hear and by the empty promises of the marketplace. Consumed by chasing the false glory of our own agendas, we forget the agenda and purpose which God has for our living. Let us confess our sins to the one who creates all of us and each of us. Now, let's pray together. All-knowing and merciful God, forgive us for ignoring you in our everyday living. We confess that there have been times when we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have disobeyed your intention for our lives. We have not loved you as much as we should. We have not loved our neighbors, and sometimes we have mistreated them. Oh God, forgive us and grant that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. The good news is that God has already forgiven us for all of our sinful living. Jesus Christ died on the cross to absolve our sin and shame. Therefore, you can be assured 
your disobedience and complete, is completely forgiven and you are free from your guilt to turn life around to more faithful and joyful living. Amen. Please say what we believe with me by using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. It is good to be with you on this beautiful Sunday morning, whether you're here worshiping with us in person or whether you're tuning in on YouTube or on our virtual service, we want to welcome you. I'm going to ask Layla, would you come up and help me this morning? And I'm just going to get one thing. I'll be right back. Can you help me push all of these? So this morning, we're going to be talking about putting on a new outfit. And do you know that this is something, Layla, that I really struggle with every day? Every morning, I look out into my closet, and I just can't decide what to wear. Sometimes I change clothes five times before I finally pick the right outfit. In all of our lives, we have a lot of choices to make. We can choose to wear a flowery dress like this one, a red one like the one I'm wearing today, a beautiful blue and white dress like the one you have on this morning, Layla. But those are not the only choices that we make every single morning. In the book of Colossians, what Dr. Irwin is going to be speaking about this morning, the Bible tells us that we have many choices to make on how we clothe ourselves. Now that doesn't just mean what kind of outfit we choose to put on. Sometimes when we wake up in the morning, we can make the choice to be, what does this say? Mad. mad. We can make the choice to be mad. It's not a very nice outfit. We can make the choice to be bad. To be bad, to be disobedient. Sometimes you disobey your parents or your teachers, maybe not on purpose. Sometimes it's just hard to do the right thing all the time. Sometimes, unfortunately, we make the choice to be sad. That's right, sometimes we make that choice to be sad and it can wreck our entire day if we choose to be sad. Get that one. Sometimes we make the choice to be jealous. You can be jealous of your friends. Maybe the friend you had at school last year isn't the same after coming back from summer break. Sometimes you look at other people and they have things that you want for yourself and that can make us jealous. Sometimes we feel empty and we 
put on just a sense of void. Do you know what that word means? It means really empty. Sometimes we don't feel anything inside. It's not a very nice outfit, is it? <laughs> but in the book of Colossians, God shows us another way. He doesn't want us to wake up and choose to be mad or sad or bad or jealous or even empty. God wants us to be clothed with love. In all things, we can take that love and put it all around us. And when we do that, everything becomes bound together in love. And all of those yucky feelings, being mad, sad, bad, jealous, or empty, come together when we follow God's word. Would you help me say a prayer this morning? Loving God, we are so grateful to be here in your presence. Thank you for clothing us with our beautiful clothes, God. But more importantly, thank you for helping us to remember that we are bound together in love. God, we want to ask a blessing for all of our children, for their teachers, for the staff, for the bus drivers, and everyone as we go into yet another week of school. And above all, God, we ask that you grant us all your sense of peace and love. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
you very much. My name is Bruce Irwin, Dr. Bruce Irwin. I'm very delighted to be with you today, and what an honor it is. And I uh, welcome all of us to this worship service. You know, one thing that I know about life in my over 50 years of ministry is that everybody has something going on. We all have something going on in our life, no matter who we are. And we know people have other things that go, go on in their lives, even today. People have joys and sorrows and concerns, things that are going on in this world. And so now in the worship service is a time when we can lift up those concerns. And uh, each person here may please lift up the concerns that you have. And then following that, we will all respond together, Lord, hear our prayer. So let us each lift up a concern that you might have this morning. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Lord, 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 hear our prayer. Our schools and all their teachers. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Okay. Yes. Oops, excuse me. Our governing part, uh, bodies of our nation. Lord, hear our prayer. Okay. Anyone else? Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we come before you once again this morning, each of us in our own hearts, but also together as this congregation of your people. God, we know you as one who is greater than any thought we might have, beyond our understanding of time and space. And yet, God, we also know you as one who is close to us, as close as with our own breath, and we thank you. We thank you for so many times when you've been there with us over and over again to help us out. Loving and gracious God, we praise your holy name. We thank you for this wonderful world in which we live. You have placed us here in the Treasure Coast in South Florida, this beautiful place. We ask that you might be with us. Uh, we may understand how thankful we need to be and how privileged we are and what we need to give back. Loving God, we thank you also for family and friends. All of us have difficulties, challenges, but we thank you for those who care about us and those whom we care about. We thank you, O oh God, for the very life breath that is in us, that which sustains us every day, for all those people who work so hard to keep life going. And so we bring before you our thoughts and our requests for prayer. Loving God, we, this very day, think of people up in New England that are rushing around, buying water, putting up um, things to keep them safe in the hurricane that is headed their way. We ask for you uh, to bless them and care for them. We pray also for the people of Haiti who have not only gone through two hurricanes, but also an earthquake. Help us to reach out to them. May they find strength from you in these very difficult times. Of course, gracious God, we ask for you to be with those who are in Afghanistan, all the people of Afghanistan, those who are trying to get out, those who are helping them to get out. Gracious God, may you give them strength. May you find new ways that we can help in that situation. Loving and gracious God, we lift up before you all those who have COVID with this new spread of the new variant, the Delta variant. We thought it was over, and now we find it to be on our doorsteps once again.
We ask for your blessing on those who have passed, those who have suffered, those who suffer the long-term effects of COVID for the families and friends. God, be with each of us and be with those who we know who have that disease. But also, God, we know that you can cure all things. And so we ask that in your mercy and time, you might help us to find a new way to be free of COVID. And God, we thank also of all the uh, people who are upset with one another. In our world today, there seems to be so much anger and confusion and loneliness. Lift, we lift up before you all those people. And we ask that you might bring your peace and your love and your justice to bear. We ask all this, trusting in your grace, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who when he was here on earth, taught us to pray as we now pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our gifts and offerings are pleasing to our God. We are grateful for his abundance care, abundant care and blessings. As we consider all he has done for us, let us consider our response in our tithes and offerings.
Let us pray. Dear Father, we humbly ask your blessing on these gifts and on each one who is given. Help us to use these offerings to follow your will and expand your kingdom. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Colossians is a really wonderful book. Hope you uh, read through it all, but especially go home and read the, this chapter and read it a couple times because it has so much in it for today. And, uh, and if we read it throughout the week, you're going to find so much in it every time you read it. So I'd like to read from you uh, beginning with the first verse of Colossians 3. So, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, whether it be fornication or impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, which is adultery, on account of those, uh, ra the wrath of God is coming to those who are disobedient. These are the ways in which you also once followed when you were living that life. But now, now you must get rid of all such things like anger and wrath, malice, slander, abusive language from your mouth, and do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and clothe yourself with a new self, which is being revealed in the knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal... There is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. Christ is all, and Christ is in all. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourself with compassion and kindness, humility and meekness and patience, and bear with one another. And if someone has a complaint against another, Forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called into one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, Teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and all gratitude in your hearts. And sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs unto God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. May God add blessing to the reading and hearing of God's holy words of scripture. Let us pray. 
God, we ask that you might speak to us once again through these ancient but contemporary words. God, we face so many challenges in this life and we need a new image. We need a new way. Bring to us that way in our hearts that we may be your lights going out to the community. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. My sermon title for today, if you happen to have that in front of you, it says, Get a New Outfit, Change Your Image. Now, someday the pandemic's going to be over. So I want you to start right now to get a new outfit, you know? Yeah, I don't know where you're going to go, but get a new outfit and change your image. You got to look good. You got to look good to make that first impression, you know? I don't know whether you heard this, but somebody said it only takes what? A minute or two minutes or whatever for people to make an impression of you. Right away, you see somebody coming in a room, you're already sizing them up. Now, my parents never wanted me to become a minister. They were around church too long. They knew better. But, you know, but I, uh, being a teenager, I want to do what I wanted to do. So I went into the ministry. Well, my mother said, if you're going to do this, then you got to look good because people will judge by what you, how you look. So um, I come from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I went to seminary, Pittsburgh Seminary. And so in Pittsburgh, I lived on the mountain. But then down in the valley, we also had a similar church. And that guy really dressed good. He always wore one of those pocket things, a uh, handkerchief in the pocket. And certain uh, people would always see what kind of socks he wore. He always looked sharp. My mother said, you have to look like that guy. Put on, And so... Uh, if my wife, my wife could tell you that all the time uh, when I go to church or have a meeting, I always have a suit and tie. Even here in Florida, I still do that. It's my mother running around in my brain doing that. But she'd also, because I'm tall, when you're tall, you sort of bend over. And she'd always smack me on the back. I, did your parents ever do that? Smack, so stand up straight, Bruce. And then... You know what I did today? The last thing I did before I, I left the house today? I polished my shoes because my mother said the most important thing what people look for is your shoes. And they want to make sure you have your shoes polished. you got to look good. That's what people judge you by. And so when you go any place in life, you have to dress well. You have to put on the right outfit to give the right impression that you want to give. There's a book, maybe some of you have read it years ago. It was called Dress for Success. Yes, Dress for Success. You know, we probably took that to heart at one time in our lives. People know you by what you put on. And what you put on is not only clothes, it's also your attitude. I bet there's some people that you know who are sort of aloof. And, you know, when they're coming down the street or wherever they're coming down, you can tell who they are just by the way they look, uh, the way they walk. And then there's other people who are always upset and angry. You, you know the kind of people. And then I know we have certain people who call us up on the telephone and tell us the same stories about their life and how bad their life has been over and over again. Do you know people like that? You hear that same story over and over again? Some people have a grudge. They keep telling that grudge over and over again. And our impression is by the kind of attitudes they have, the kind of uh, stories they tell. Do you remember we used to talk, well, sort of we used to talk years and years ago about people put on airs. Airs, you know. Today we, we, we talk more about they give off an aura. And, and we, that's, people have an attitude about them. So we put on, we dress up, we put on our clothes, and we take care of our hair, put on makeup, and all that we do to get ready to go out. But you also have a certain attitude. I'll bet you, when you go to work, you have a different attitude than you do when you go out to a friend's house. Or when, when you meet your wife you have a, or your husband, you have a different attitude than you do when you meet your mother or father. You put on a different attitude. How do you dress up? It gives the image 
of who you are. And people will judge you and what you believe by that. Sometimes, as I suggested at the very beginning, you got to get a new outfit for life. I remember when I was in elementary school, we always went downtown. That's what you called it in Pittsburgh, down to the main. You always went to downtown, and, you, and every year my mother would make me go through all these stores to find the right preppy clothes to wear that I go to uh, my, my classes with all the time. Do you remember doing something like that? Or going to a special event. If you have a special hotsy totsy event that you're going to go to around here, you get a special dress, you get a special suit, you get a special shirts to wear. Sometimes uh, you get uh, special clothes when, to wear when you have a graduation or were confirmed. Up north, I don't know, some of you may be not from up north, so you know about wool. Some of us had to wear wool. And years ago, when you had to wear wool, those dresses and those pants were all itchy. I hated wool. I hated wool. But we had to dress up in it, so we looked right. Getting a new outfit. It's all about changing your image. Telling people who you are. If you get a new outfit to change your image and impress people, before you put a new outfit on, what's the first thing you have to do? Before you put some new clothes on, you have to do what? Take the old clothes off. And the Apostle Paul talks about this right in our passage from Colossians. The first thing he says you have to do is take off the old negative attitudes and selfish desires. Colossians 5, uh, 3, 5. Put to death whatever in you is earthly, whether it be fornication or impurity or evil desires or greed. Put them to death. Undress. Take off. Get rid of all those things that are in you that are unchristian. He says like wrath and anger and malice and slander and abusive language from your mouth. Now I know you don't ever do any of those things, but there are people who do those things and we're supposed to take off, stop doing those things. And don't put on those bad things. Don't take those bad habits and, and put them in the closet because that's what you do to your clothes, don't you? Do you, when you get a new dress or, or you know, a new outfit, a new coat, whatever, do you just throw it in the garbage right away? Not usually. We hide it in the back of the closet because someday we may want to go to it. And maybe the, the new outfit isn't what we'll be comfortable with, so we're really comfortable with some of those other things. Well, this is true of our bad attitudes, too, the bad things that we have on. Sometimes our grudges that we want to get rid of, well, we don't get rid of them. We just put them in the back. We might need them someday. Paul here says very clearly that we are to take all of those old attitudes that we had being part of this world, and we are to put them in a garbage can Throw them out, never to be seen again. And we are to put on now a new spiritual attitude to make a good image. But it's not so people will look and say how great she is or how great he is coming down the street. We don't get put on these new things that Paul tells us to do so that we can have praise. But instead, it's so that we can be the image of God and God can be seen through us. Indeed, you've probably heard this before. In, in theology, there's something called imago dei, which means in the image of God. You know? And so we are to be like in the image of God. We are to reflect God. I'll bet you you all here uh, have Christmas Eve, don't you? And at Christmas Eve, what do you do? You light the candles or you, whatever kind of candles, whether they're real or not, but you have the candles because the candles are light and you take them out into the world and you become the light of the world. You are the image of God going out into the world so that other people can see God in Christ in you. The new spiritual outfit is 
that you can be like the message of God going out into the world. So the Apostle Paul says, we are being renewed. In the scripture, it says, we are being renewed. Not that all of a sudden you can do it. Can you change from being who you are like that? No. But instead, you are being renewed every day. Try and be different. You've tried to be Christian already. And uh, I try to be Christian. And every day I fail. But I try harder and harder all the time. Getting redressed, making the transition takes time. To be reclothed, we try and we fail and we try again. Just like many times you want to go back to your closet and get that old outfit and put it back on. But you need to keep working on the new outfit, the new thing. So what is your style? If I were to ask you what store you'd go to to get a new outfit, I bet you you'd have some good shop. Maybe here in the area, maybe go to Palm Beach or wherever to, to get dressed. What's your style? And it's all about the whole outfit, too. It's not just the dress or the, the shirt. Instead, it's the shoes. It's all that you put on, the makeup, everything, your coat. It's the whole package. It's the pieces of your spiritual outfit. What does Paul tell us about the pieces of our spiritual outfit? We are to put on compassion. What's compassion mean? To care about someone. We're to be kind, it's Senex says, to be warm and affectionate. Not everybody's easily warm and affectionate. We're to have lowliness, which means humility. Have you ever heard someone, even leaders say, oh, I can do it all. It's only, it's all up to me. No, we're not not supposed to do that. We're to feel humility. We're to be meek, to, to let other people uh, sometimes do what they want to do to us, but still be strong. We would have patience, forbearing, which means if someone strikes back, strikes you, what are you supposed to do? Hit them back? Some people say hit them back 10 times is hard, but what are we supposed to do? Someone strikes you in one hand, what do you do? Turn to them the other cheek. Right. And we are to forgive one another as the Lord God has forgiven each one of us. Above all, we're to put on love, which binds everything together. Do you want people to love you? Do you want unconditional love? Guess what? You can do that for a lot of people. There are a lot of people, your family, people in your family who want unconditional love who need unconditional love. Love binds it all together. It's one of the main things we can do as Christians. Then it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Again, we can be, many of us, look at, the, you're going to go home and put on the TV, put on your computer, and what are you going to see? You're going to see a lot of peaceful stuff? No. Yeah. We would have that sense of peace. These are the different kind of images we can give off as Christians. And whatever you do by word or deed, do everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. These are the kind of things that we need to put on as Christians. My favorite verse in this whole passage is the first verse. Let's go back to that. It says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above and set your minds on things that are above, not our things that are still on earth. If you have been raised with Christ, I know you have been raised with Christ, because I bet you most all of you have been baptized. You, you're members of this congregation, and I know that you believe in Jesus Christ, and so I know that that's in your heart. If you have been raised, then seek the things that are, are from above, and not the things that are on earth. You see, all the things that are on earth wants to pull us back and get us involved. You're going to be hearing again those talking heads when you go home. Trying to say, I like this. This is wrong. This is right. I hate these people. I hate these people. You're going to hear all that. We're fed all that day by day. Almost from birth we've been fed. And never has it been so strong as it is now. Get rid of the things that are on the earth. And instead... Seek the things that are on the above. We can change the world by this. We can change the world by simply doing this. 
Do you remember I started out my sermon by saying, put on a new post-pandemic outfit? Recently, we talked to someone who and said, you know, after the pandemic's over, I'll bet think people are going to be nicer to one another. And she said, no, they're not. <laughs> no, they're not. Yeah, if they keep the same outfit, that will happen. No, they won't. But we have an opportunity here. We have a great opportunity. And I know when you go into your boardrooms, where some of you go, when you go into school, when you go into even the social, all the social things we do, we have the opportunity to reflect a different way, to reflect the Christ-like way, to put on the attitudes of love and mercy and kindness and all those attitudes that we need to put on. And this is especially important for us today. We can change it. We can change it. And we can make people feel better about life. It says, and, and don't be scared to do this, because it says we are hidden in Christ, in God. You see, in the glory that when you do these things and people see you in a different way and all of a sudden, oh, look how loving and how kind and how, how great that person is and how they're thinking a different way, a God-like way. When people see that, they won't, you're hidden in Christ. They may get angry with you, but it's really you're in Christ. You're hidden in Christ in God. And when God's glory comes, your glory will be there as well. So... I give you permission to go get a new outfit this week. But that outfit, make it to be a Christ-like outfit. Change what's inside of you. So the people, when you come down the street, say, hey, something different about that person. Because they look different. I was going to ask, too, I forgot this. Uh, what color, some of you go to New York City, don't you? What color do people wear most in New York City? What color is their outfits? What color? Black, right? Black. You know, a lot of people will go in their lives wearing dark colors, don't they? A lot of people are dragging, wearing black and brown and not really the color. All the feelings they have, they drag around carrying that. I left Florida because you can wear chartreuse. I could wear a chartreuse uh, a jacket or something, right? Yeah, everybody dresses up. It looks great. And that's who you need to be. You need to be the brightness into the world. You need to the, be the brightness of God. And people will see that and begin to question and follow you. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we thank you. We thank you that you have brought us to a new understanding of life. That we don't have to be captured by all the downness of this world, by all the conflict and hate and all that goes on in this world. Instead, God, help us to concentrate on that new way that you have shown us through Christ. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us now join in singing together. My hope is built on nothing less. It's on page 379 in your hymnal. Those who are able to stand, will you please stand?
And now go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to the things you know to be good. Render to no person an evil for an evil. Instead, support the weak. Help the afflicted. And here's the hard one. Honor all people. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Please stay for the postlude.